All right, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone um, and welcome to the CORE's forum on the 12 best practices for research data sharing. I'm Howard Ratner, the executive director of CORE's and I'll be your moderator for today. So we've had over 250 people register for today's event from all around the globe. And but today's forum would not be possible without the generous sponsorship coming from AIP Publishing, AAP, Crossref, Geoscience World, and STM. So today's forum will run until 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight's time and will also be recorded for later viewing. And we'll also be sharing all of the individual presentations on the Chorus event website. But as our speakers present today, feel free to use Zoom's QA feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. They'll either be answered by the speakers live or in the QA window. And also feel free to upvote questions that you think are important, so we are sure to get to them. So a little commercial about Chorus and why we do these things. We are a community effort dedicated to making open research work. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We work to develop metrics about open data. We help improve the overall quality of their metadata related to open research. And we host forums and workshops like today's forum to connect the stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with each other. So relevant to today's discussion, Chorus has also created indices for publisher data availability policies and software citation policies. And these are, are reviewed annually. I'm also proud to say that Chorus is an endorser of the STM Data Site Crossref Joint Statement on Research Data that you're gonna hear a lot about today. And by signing up, we're making a pledge to embrace the best practices and promote their value to our stakeholder community. So as I mentioned, I will be your moderator for today. Um, and one of the duties of the moderator is to, is to introduce all of the speakers. So let me quickly get through that. Um, first off, you're gonna hear three speakers, which, which are the creators of the best practices. That's Hilke from STM, Helena from Datasite, and Patricia from Crossref. Those three will then be followed by three endorsers who will explain what they're doing to make data sharing happen. And those are Katie from Elsevier, Daniel from uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, GBI facility, and Jamie from uh, University of Colorado Boulder. So without any further ado, because we only have an hour, over to you, Hilke. Fantastic, thank you very much, Howard. And thank you all for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So my name is Hilke Kors. I'm the Chief Information Officer for STM Solutions, part of the STM Association. We're a global association for academic scholarly publishers with over 140 members worldwide and really committed to advancing trusted research. And of course, research data we feel is an important element of that mission. Next slide, please. So for a long time, STM has recognized that sharing of research data is crucial to advance science and research for transparency, reproducibility, but also to provide additional opportunities for scientific discovery and collaboration. On this slide, I've plotted some of the milestones in that journey, dating back to 2007 with the Brussels Declaration that recognized that raw research data should be made freely available to all researchers. Then the joint statement in 2012 that we issued together with DataSite, work on the SCOLICS framework to facilitate the exchange of links between research data and the literature, um, a focused effort to really progress things in 2020 with the Research Data Year, Sharing Sites program. Um, and then at the end of last year, the joint statement on research data together with Crossref and Data Sites and STM, which is the topic or the, um, uh, the initiative that uh, led to the webinar today. Next slide, please. So the Research Data program in kicked off in 2020. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a little bit more detail about that included a range of activities to promote the sharing, linking, and citing of research data. On this slide, I've collected some of the participants and some of the key results all, all visualized together. Um, you see an increase in the number of journals with data policies, with data availability statements, and also journals that connect with this SCOLIX framework to expose data citations for further use downstream. Next slide, please. So that brings me to today, or actually to the end of last year with the 2023 Joint Statement on Research Data. 
which we felt was timely to do and really meant to reaffirm the importance of research data to improve the utility and the rigor of the scholarly record. Um, and doing that in a way that offers very practical, actionable recommendations to the various stakeholder groups to really further that objective. Why did we feel that it was a good time to do that? Basically for two reasons. On the one hand, I think we, uh, we saw significant progress since that original 2012 statement uh, with lots of things that have been developed there, lots of enablers that have been put in place. But at the same time, also recognizing that research data sharing is not as self-evident a step in the research cycle as we'd all like it to see. So we thought this would be a good moment to spur additional actions and hopefully give the right recommendations for people to do so, to really benefit from those enablers that are now in, in place and really further advance and push the uh, uh, practices around research data sharing. Next slide, please. As in many things around research and, and scholarly communications, this is all about collaboration and collaboration we feel is key to really advance this agenda. Um, and for that reason, we really formulated these recommendations at the various stakeholder groups. So there are some that are directed at researchers, at data repositories, publishers, funders, research organizations, policy-making institutions, and of course, several recommendations span those different stakeholder groups. And we'll highlight a few of those in the webinar today. What we also did is ask organizations to endorse those statements, to visibly support them, and also optionally to explain which practical steps they will be taking to really further the recommendations and to really explain what they will do, also in the hope that maybe other organizations may learn from that or, or be uh, inspired. Next slide, please. So zooming in on some of the recommendations for publishers, which are on, collected on the slide here, you will see there are recommendations around policies and instructions around data citations and data availability statements, but also more operational aspects to really encourage publishers to capture data citations and capture data links and then make them available, push them into Crossref where they will be made available for further use downstream by other actors. Next slide, please. Of course, we're mindful that a set of recommendations and a statement is a good thing and hopefully will be of value to the community. But of course, the journey doesn't stop by making those recommendations. So we've also put in place um, a board that will monitor progress um, and can initiate further actions, further interventions, if we feel that would be appropriate or needed at any moment. That's me for now. Happy to address further questions a bit later on in the webinar. And let me pass over the baton to Helena. Thank you, Hilke. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for the invitation and the chance to be uh, part of the session today. Um, I'm Helena, I'm the Director of Community Engagement at uh, Datasite. And Datasite is a global community, uh, a global nonprofit membership organization and we work with over 3,000 repositories around the world to uh, provide DOIs for research outputs and resources. Uh, and we work with many different types of repositories and DOIs are registered for different types of outputs. But I guess as the name data site implies, uh, data sets are a very important part of that. And when data site was uh, founded in uh, 2009, uh, data citation was a very important use case. Um, if we go to the next slide, I think we, we probably all know uh, what we're talking about when talking about data citation, but just to make sure we're on the same page, a data citation is a reference to data to a data set in the same way that researchers provide uh, bibliographic references to other scholarly resources, obviously uh, articles are the most well-known example but also when an article is based on a data set, uh, the data set can be cited in the text and a reference can be included in the reference list of the article. On the next slide, um, yeah, Hilke already uh, showed the, the joint statement. Uh, yeah, we're very pleased um, to be part of that again, following the initial statement in 2012, 10 years later, we started talking about what's needed now uh, and developed this joint statement where we um, 
yeah, really saw a role for all the different stakeholders in the ecosystem. And so uh, in my talk, I want to highlight the actions that researchers and repositories can take, because I think the actions that repositories can take really depend on researchers first depositing their data sets. So that's really a first step that researchers identify a repository where they can deposit the data and preferably a repository where then a persistent identifier, a DOI, is registered with accompanying metadata. And then we also really encourage researchers to establish links between that data set and other outputs, such as the article, and to cite their own data set if they publish an article that's based on the data. And in addition to that, uh, when researchers use research data created by others, it's also very important that they provide attribution by citing the data set uh, in the article. Now, repositories um, working with researchers, they need to enable researchers to share research outputs in a fair way and assigning persistent identifiers and having fields available for different metadata elements to describe the data set, but also to uh, established relationships uh, is very important. And then, um, as Hilke said, there's also really an, an infrastructure component and repositories and publishers um, both need to ensure that um, the, the metadata, um, that the information about the relationship between articles and data set is present in the metadata that's registered with DataCite and Crossref so that that information can be shared um, with the broader community. Uh, looking at the next slide, you can see that um, repositories play an important role in data citation because the data citation can be established from the site of the article when a data set is cited um, in the article. But the, the relationship can also be established um, by the repository when a repository is aware of that relationship. And uh, the image you see on my slide is um, our uh, web interface, data site Fabrica. And so for uh, repositories that manually register DOIs, uh, that can also be done through an API, but um, to visualize what that looks like, um, they have the possibility when registering a DOI to indicate um, which uh, related identifiers exist. And looking at the next slide, in the metadata schema, there is a related identifier field to establish that relationship. And so you can say, okay, for this data set that I'm now registering a DOI for, there's the following related identifier that's also a DOI and a relationship between this data set and, for example, the article is that it's referenced by. Now, on the next slide, I'm going into a little bit more detail because, as I said, the relationship can be established from the side of the article, but also from the side of the data set. And therefore, there's also a certain directionality in the relationships that you can establish. So if you want to cite the data set from the side of the journal article, then the data set is ref that then the article references or size or is supplemented by the data set. Um, but in the other direction, you can then also indicate that this data set is referenced by, is cited by, and is supplement to. And then if you want to cite the article uh, from the side of the data set, um, the relation types are the other way around. Now, obviously, I realize you're maybe not going to remember at all, but the main point I want to make is that it's very important to add this information wherever possible and add it um, to the data set metadata and add it to the article metadata so that as much information as possible about citations is present. And then on the next slide, uh, you can see that um, we try to aggregate that information. So what you're seeing here is data site commons, which is our discovery platform. Um, you're looking at Howard's screen, so I can't point to anything. Uh, but underneath the title, you can see that there are 17 citations um, for, this, uh, for this specific data set. And so we get that information from um, the metadata deposited by Crossref and data site members. And therefore, we know that this data set was cited 17 times. 
On my final slide, uh, I'm sharing a screenshot of the data citation corpus. That's a very exciting project that we're working on right now to aggregate not only citation information from data site metadata and cross ref metadata, uh, but from all possible sources so that we can really provide a comprehensive overview uh, of all the data that's been cited. And we're planning to do a lot more work on that in the coming period. So you can already see the first release um, of the dashboard following the link on the slide. And uh, yeah, please keep an eye on future developments. And with that, I'm handing over to Patricia. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, all right, just stuck. Uh, I think many of you are probably familiar with Crossref, but just a brief overview to put us in context of the current discussion. Um, we've been around since 2000. Um, we were originally uh, founded by some scientific societies and publishers in the US and Western Europe. Um, today, our membership comprises is comprised of just 35% publishers with the largest group of our members largest chunk of our membership being self-identifying as research in institutions and universities. Uh, the remaining 25% is made up of a combination of funders um, who are Crossref members and registered grant records, um, use of facilities and other types of um, funding support. Um, alongside, uh, we've also got museums, repositories, government organizations, conference providers, standards organizations, Indiv and individual scholars and uh, a few uh, members who defy categorization. <laughs> so membership is really open to organizations that produce research outputs and to funders who register grant re records with us. We currently have over 19,000 um, members from 150 countries. And we also work with third party service providers and metadata users who contribute to our metadata store and make use of our metadata via our, our API and search interfaces for a, a range of large range of purposes. All of our metadata is openly available uh, via our REST API. So to date, our members have registered over 156 million DOI records uh, with around 73% of those records being journal articles. There's another 16% for books and book chapters and the remaining for other types of records we support, which include conference papers, reports, standards, dissertations, preprints, and other types of posted content, uh, peer review reports, data sets, and most recently grants. And the list of, of types of content we support will keep growing. Um, so accepting references as part of a complete met met metadata record registered with us has been part of our service for a long time. Um, but in recent years, uh, we have really added a push to expand the range of citations along with everyone else um, to include data citations as common practice. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> which brings us to our, the Crossref's goal was just to create a rich and reuse reusable open network of relationships connecting research organizations, people's things in action a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. And uh, that's a grand statement, but uh, basically it means metadata is a good thing and it makes all of these things possible by connecting different parts of this ecosystem. And data sharing and data citation are very essential to this. Um, the metadata records with Crossref, metadata records registered with Crossref DOIs contain in most cases reach reusable metadata that enable these connections. Um, and our metadata records, particular, in particular, are increasingly containing, well, they, they contain DOIs to, to point to other DOI metadata records by citations and relationship metadata. They also include other persistent identifiers like RAR IDs and ORCID IDs. Um, so that we can, uh, you know, figure out who is who is funding what, what researcher is involved in th this data generation, et cetera. It, it really enables a lot. Um, at the at the moment, what our vision is maybe sixty percent possible, um, and we're we're hoping to expand that by adding, adding more of these uh, metadata connections and increasing the metadata registered with us by in encouraging our metadata 
our members to register things like data citations. All right, next slide. So there are some important details involved in the joint statement that um, are, 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 <clears throat> are very fundamental to Crossref. The details are important, but overall the call is to make data available, make data availability statements identifiable, make the data easy to find by following basic citation best practices by using persistent identifiers like DOIs, and by registering the appropriate met metadata with our Crossref. Um, our members are obligated to include DOI, DOI links in their references wherever possible to make these persistent identifiers very available and easy to use. And as, as I mentioned, we also strongly re recommend our members to send us references and include those DOIs as, as part of their met metadata record so that those can be come available to our metadata users downstream. Um, this, of course, I think this is the hard part for, <laughs> for publishers, honestly. Uh, this requires publishers to collect and record data as citations. To send them to us, they have to have them in the first place, which was not common practice years ago, but it's becoming increasingly so, and it's absolutely necessary that those efforts continue. All right, next slide. So there's a blog post on our website for those of you who want to learn the details about participating in data, data citation using Crossref. Um, the post is about a year old, old, but the message is clear. If you are registering your metadata with, with Crossref, include data citations as citations with DOIs in the metadata you register with Crossref. That includes if it's a Crossref DOI or more likely for data, a data site DOI. Um, this is the best way and the cleanest way to make citations identifiable and persistent and available. Um, and I want to add, we have supported identifying data citation using uh, what we called our event data a API that's being retired in favor of what we're currently calling our relationships API. That process is in flux, but we're hoping that we will be able to offer a more robust service soon. Uh, currently, we're struggling with some scale and some data quality issues. Um, but as far as the overall process, we are fairly e we are able to fairly easy easily match citations registered with us to Crossref DOIs when metadata exists in our database, but not so. But we can't like our technology is not completely compatible yet. So we're not matching those to the data site DOIs yet. So th this relationship service bridge bridges the gap between Crossref and data site to match data citations to articles registered with, with us when our members haven't explicitly included a DOI citations. Um, there's more details on our website in our community forum and I'll drag, drop a link to that in the chat when I'm done talking because I, I can't really multitask. Um, all right, next slide. So here's just an example of what a data, data citation looks like in the wild. It's a very simple thing, but I, I do acknowledge that the, the effort of publishers to, to alter their workflows to start collecting these citations. This is just a citation and a reference list with a DOI pointing to a data set in the Dryad repository. And then next slide. And so this is what it looks like in Crossref. So this is really how like after you've done all the effort of collecting these data citations and passing them along, this is how simple it becomes. Um, we support XML input. So there's, in this example, there's the metadata, but you really only need to send us the DOI. And then on the other side, you really need, only need the DOI to be output and then you can retrieve um, the metadata record for that DOI from either data set or Crossref. Um, so there are uh, some other things you can do to provide more details about a data set is used. You can flag relationship metadata what, to indicate whether a data set supplements a journal article, for example, um, but that's getting really into the details and beyond the scope of this talk, but, there, but we do have a lot of documentation on our website. All right, and next up is Catherine. Thanks, Patricia. Hi, so my name's Katie Eve and I'm Policy Director for Open Science at Elsevier and thanks for inviting me today to share a publisher perspective on what the best practices mean for us as a publisher. 
Elsevier is proud to lend our endorsement to STMs, Crossrefs and Data Sites latest joint statement on research data. I'm sure I didn't tell anyone here that open research data sharing is of critical importance, given it underpins reproducibility and research integrity and therefore nurtures trust in research. Elsevier has a long history of supporting research data sharing. As a co-founder of Force 11, we played a role in developing the FAIR principles for data sharing. We also implemented the Force 11 data citation principles across our journals, meaning our authors are encouraged to include data citations with DOIs as part of their reference list, and our production and publication systems could then process these. And this is aligned with recommendations five, six, and eight. At Elsevier, we empower and enable researchers to store, share, discover, and effectively reuse research data in a number of ways. We're leveraging our publishing expertise and workflows in support of this. During our submission process, we prompt and enable authors to share links to their data sets stored in a repository of their choice. For researchers who wish to share their data in a generalist repository, we make available Mendeley data, which is an open and free repository that uses DOIs and is supported and endorsed through the NIH Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative. We're also continually looking at ways to enhance our systems and workflows to maximize data sharing. Many of our journals have policies in place requiring researchers to share their data um, transparently or otherwise explain why they can't do that. We're continually expanding on this in line with recommendation four. Additionally, we ask authors to provide data availability statements or DASs, which are human and machine readable, as in recommendation seven. A well-documented challenge with these, though, is that researchers tend to select the option data available on request, which is the least work intensive option for them, but is also rife with challenges when it comes to another researcher actually wishing to access and reuse that data. We're therefore experimenting with refining DASs, um, the options themselves and the order in which they appear across our journals, with the goal of promoting greater research data sharing unless there's a truly compelling reason not to. We've kicked off an experiment, um, starting with a journal with unusually high existing rates of data sharing and engaged editors. Through refining the DAS statements, as I've just described, on the journal Animal Behaviour, we were able to achieve an increase in data sharing rates from 46% to 89% of submissions with a linked data set, a really impressive increase. Of course, though, our goal isn't just about achieving data sharing, but making sure that their data is high quality and reusable. Specialist repositories may handle data validation, which is why we encourage researchers to deposit their data in the place that makes the most sense for them and for their community, which may, of course, be a subject matter repository. And we have many examples of such repositories on our fairsharing.org page. Members of our research integrity and publication ethics team are also trained in various analyses of data valid validity and are involved in uh, testing and developing targeted automated checks. Unfortunately, fully automated data validation checking isn't possible yet, but more tools like um, StatCheck, for example, are being developed on an ongoing basis and will continue to monitor and evaluate these as they come online. However, peer review checks, particularly for scientific reasonableness, remain absolutely critical. Publishers, of course, play a, a vital role in promoting data sharing and citation, and I hope to have given you a bit of a flavor of the actions that we as Elsevier are taking. But that said, journals by their very nature operate far along in the research process. So we really welcome that the joint statement calls for collective action across all stakeholders in the research community, with that collaboration highlighted in recommendations 10 and 11, along with clear and concrete recommendations and steps for every stakeholder to take, to take which is really valuable. Partnership across stakeholders is essential to encouraging effective research data sharing practices throughout the research life cycle. And as part of this, and finally referring to recommendation 12, we absolutely agree that reform of research evaluation is key to driving change in research culture and in growing adoption of open science practices. We've developed a framework to support the research community in developing fairer, more transparent, and more fit for purpose approaches to academic evaluation, which incentivize and reward open science practices. And we've got multiple collaborations ongoing to develop new tools and practices in support of this, for example, with the UK Reproducibility Network currently. In summary, we will continue to take steps to accelerate research data sharing, both on an individual basis as ourselves and in collaboration with the wider research community to ensure trusted research output, which stands to, stands to advance science for all of society. Thanks again for the opportunity to share our perspective with you here today. And I'll now hand over to Daniel. 
Thanks, Katie. Um, so yeah, I'm Daniel and I work for the Secretariat of the Global Biodiversity Information uh, Facility, or GBIF as it is more commonly known. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with uh, GBIF, I will start with a super brief intro. GBIF is an international network and data infrastructure aimed at providing anyone, anywhere, free and open access to data about all types of life on Earth. We're funded by the governments of our country participants, and we currently serve more than 100,000 data sets from around 2,200 publishers. Uh, in total, more than 2.6 billion species occurrences are available through GBIF. That is records of where and when organisms occur. Uh, these records are downloaded at a rate of more than 160 billion per month, and they have been used in more than 10,000 peer-reviewed journal articles. On the next slide, I'd like to share some of our best practices for research data sharing. Uh, this does not appear to be my next slide, sorry. Um, okay, I think there's a slide missing. Never mind. Um, I'll just keep going. So, so um, GBIF assigns DOIs to all the data sets that we index, uh, but uh, we also assign DOIs to queries resulting in aggregated downloads across dozens, hundreds, if not thousands of different, uh, different occurrence data sets. Uh, we also offer the ability uh, to create derived data sets with their own new DOIs representing data access outside the main GBIF uh, web services. So for example, through third party libraries, all data sets and their metadata is, is, uh, is, is accessible through uh, web pages, but also through uh, REST API uh, in a JSON format, which is also shared with uh, our DOI metadata registered with DataCite. Uh, GBIF data can be downloaded in a number of uh, different formats, ranging from simple CSV files to more um, to to column-oriented parquet format. Uh, and we also uh, make available such data packages uh, for direct analysis in various commercial cloud computing environments. Uh, and with data coming from a variety of sources, standardization is obviously key. Uh, we follow the Darwin Core Standard, which is a community-developed biodiversity data standard governed and ratified by the Biodiversity Information Standards Body, also known as TADWIC. Okay, so yeah, there, for some reason, I seem to be missing some slides here. <laughs> anyway. So when a user downloads occurrence data from GBIF, um, we provide them with a single unique DOI representing specifically the data that they requested. Uh, and when this is cited, in, or when, when, when that download is cited in a paper uh, that makes use of the data, we rely on the metadata of the download data set to count the citations of the parent data sets from which the data originated. This means that an author can cite a single DOI while uh, attributing hundreds of dataset publishers in the process. And this allows these publishers to easily keep track of how their data uh, is used and by which papers. Uh, can we go back a couple of slides to one of my graphs? I apologize for this. That one, exactly, yeah. So uh, use of GBIF data continues to increase at a rate of about 20% each year. So we're currently seeing about five papers uh, using uh, GBIF data every single day. This process uh, of identifying these papers is very largely manual and very labor intensive because data citation practices just aren't good enough. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry. Anyway, there we go. One back, please. Yes. So, because if people don't use DOIs for citing uh, for these citations, um, and and this, these citations don't add, uh, uh, end up in the article metadata, uh, the system doesn't work. Since we started assigning DOIs to datasets and downloads in 2015, the uptake of citing these have been very slow. Uh, and in 2017, we started a campaign directed at authors 
uh, of papers that use GBIF data but fail to cite them using a DOI. And this has been a fairly intense effort, but it seems to have paid off as we can see the people who have been contacted seem to get it right the next time they use data. So all in all, we are seeing DOI cited or used in citations of GBIF data in just over 60% of the papers we log. So we're getting there, but we can't make it alone. Next slide, please. So within the spirit of this joint statement that we at GBIF fully uh, endorse, we would love to improve the situation by working together with all relevant stakeholders, but particularly journal publishers and their staff uh, to not only ensure that instructions for citing data are good enough, but also to work towards automatic editorial workflows that can flag bad citations so that they may be corrected before publication. In fact, we believe it may be time for journal publishers uh, to help us take a step further from simply encouraging and recommending um, to actually implementing a policy of mandatory PIT-based data citations at least for the, the in the cases where we know that they are available. Last slide. Daniel, do you want me to go back? I, I did locate your missing slide. Apologies, this is my totally my fault. Would you I, like to I mean, I, I think I think Absolutely. we're good. <laughs> I think I, I've I've made my points clear, but uh, I can always we can always pull them up if there are any any relevant questions. Right. All right, so that's 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 all for me. Thanks for your attention and thanks to Cores for providing this platform for today's discussion. I look forward to to answering questions during the Q and A. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Jamie Wittenberg. I'm the Assistant Dean for Research and Innovation Strategies at the University of Colorado Boulder Libraries. And I'm really pleased to be here and provide a sort of institutional and research library perspective on the joint statement um, on research data. We were an early endorser, um, something that I'm very proud of. Uh, and we have several ongoing projects in our library that relate to the principles in the joint statement that I'll share. Um, one is that our library's institutional repository, CU Scholar, has been working for several years to achieve Core Trust SEAL certification, which we achieved uh, last year um, after um, many years working towards the 16 requirements for best practices and reliability based on our infrastructure and digital object management and technology support. And this work directly supports uh, the principal um, established in providing a safe and, and trusted environment for researchers in our community to publish their data. And I do think in our library, um, we are fairly representative of large public research libraries in the United States um, in our work towards improving our institutional repository to support this kind of research data. And this work has been ongoing for many years. We're also uh, working in our library center for research data and digital scholarship um, on a grant, our faculty librarians are working with our close colleagues at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is also located here in Boulder, Colorado, on a National Science Foundation Barros grant. Um, we're working to establish community-informed recommendations on how to assign persistent identifiers like DOIs, data site DOIs, and RRIDs, research resource identifiers, to research facilities and instrumentation. So um, things that are um, more on the sort of instruments and facilities side that require persistent identifiers. And we're hoping that that will really help to move the needle um, on, on persistent identifiers for those kinds of objects. Um, item 11 on the joint statement is one that we're just embarking on a new project to address. So we're a pilot site for the California Digital Library and Association for Research Libraries IMLS funded machine actionable data management plan project. Um, and as a sort of pilot site at CU, uh, we built a cross campus team that includes members of the libraries, our research computing office, our research innovation office, which is sponsored projects and grants, externally funded projects, our laboratory for atmospheric and space physics, and our office of data analytics. And we're working with the project leaders to develop and evaluate workflows for leveraging machine actionable research data management plans 
Um, one of the things that's exciting about this is that we're looking specifically at NASA data management plans. NASA is our biggest funder at CU Boulder, and we're excited to see the ways that these new workflows we're establishing for machine actionable data management plans will improve collaboration between all areas of the university to facilitate um, data publishing and sharing and help support our researchers in implementing those best practices. I think the biggest implementation challenge for us when we think uh, about the, the joint statement in these principles is item 12. I know this has been mentioned by other panelists. Part of the challenge is that we don't really have a standardized, transparent, and widely adopted um, framework for metrics for data that can be used for evaluation. There's a global change movement um, that's been addressed uh, uh, make data count, trying to solve this problem. And last September, as part of the 2023 Make Data Count Summit, which was uh, generously funded by the Wellcome Trust, there was a panel, I moderated uh, that panel, and it was on the question of data metrics in tenure and promotion. We're currently finalizing a paper with those panelists and several others. It'll be called something like 10 simple rules for recognizing data and software contributions and hiring promotion and tenure. Um, this is an example of the kind of thing that we're doing to try to advance this work. But I do think, I think it's important to have a sort of aspirational item to work towards when it comes to data sharing. We haven't arrived. Um, so I'm really pleased that we can continue to sort of refine and improve our adoption of these principles going forward in collaboration with many other people in the community and other stakeholders who are doing similar kinds of work. Um, that's what I have to share. I'm happy to share uh, more details about any of those projects or others that we've taken on at CU Boulder. Um, but for now, I'll pass it back to open things up for questions. Yeah, so if we can have all the speakers come back on. Great. Um, so I'll kick off. There's been a couple of questions and I'll definitely, and for the audience members, please do ask your questions in the QA box or chat or whatever you'd prefer. Um, and we'll definitely get to those. But so I'll, I'll kick off with a question that I had. Um, we have a lot of institutions that are listening in today. So from one of the speakers or more, what do you think institutions can do to really support these best practices? Anyone want to start? No thoughts? All right, Jamie. Well, I mean, I think that a place to start um, is an evaluation of current infrastructure to ensure that the infrastructure that's being provisioned by the institution is in accordance with best practices and community standards. I think one of the challenges is multiple, like like in any sort of uh, sector, multiple sort of competing approaches um, and standards. I know that there's some conversation happening even now in the Q&A um, about making sure that community groups are coordinating with each other in their efforts to improve these practices. Um, so I think a, a sort of assessment of current infrastructure and practices with an eye towards alignment um, could be a really great first step. So I think I got disconnected for a second. So I only heard the first part of your question, but I think you were asking what institutions can do, but not sure what followed from that. You need to support the best practices. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, I really think just looking at the basics, I have the impression looking at the data sets out there that still the majority of data sets do not get deposited and are not shared publicly. So I think that's really a key starting point to enable data citation, that data sets are actually deposited. And I think institutions can play an important role there in terms of providing repository infrastructure, but also policies, guidance, support, et cetera. So I think that's very important to consider. Katie, you were next. Yeah, I was going to add sort of that education uh, piece, the training and education. Certainly we've got, um, not just you know showcasing us here, else a bit here, but we have um, 
it's called the Research Academy, where we have kind of tutorials that researchers can uh, be directed towards if they want guidance on how to go about this process. But I'm, I'm aware that a lot of institutions have sort of in-house experts um, and they can really play a big role in yeah, providing the expertise that researchers need. Great, Hilke. I was going to say something very similar to Katie, just to add to that list, what I think all of us can do, any stakeholder groups, and that's really raising awareness with researchers. At the end of the day, they, they need to do a lot of the work, right? Um, so raising awareness for the solutions, the infrastructure that exists to make that easier for them, but also point them to, to the benefits and the practices that are out there. So uh, we do have um, Sun Young has raised his hand. Um, do you want to ask your question in chat, Sun or do you want to just me to make sure that I cover your question in QA, which I was going to do next? All right, I'm just going to ask Sun Young's question that he had raised um, in chat. Um, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but basically he is talking about the fact that uh, he's very interested in data management and sharing uh, sharing, and the fact that there's some heavyweight players that are already out there. Um, and how can we move it forward in a more inclusive and synchronous way? Anybody have a thought on that? And in particular, he's talking about the NIH DMS policy. One, one small comment from me or a uh, reflection on it. I think in, in several of the conversations in the presentation today, we also spoke about the importance of machine readability of data, readability statements, but also data management plans. I think that is really a critical enabler to be able to really do that type of monitoring and be able to see what's happening. Are we making progress? Um, and and, and how, how, do we, how do we go from there? Anyone else? Maybe a very practical thing uh, to add, uh, because of the comment about data management plans and data sets coming out of that. I think a lot of the sort of practical things we discussed around how to link articles and data sets also apply to other outputs. So you can also use metadata to, for example, link data management plans to data sets to articles to establish those connections so that it becomes much easier to track um, what's coming out of research projects. So just as a more practical note. And I see Sang Yong is now also <laughs> on the panel. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, it'd be much easier to explain, um, you know, by speaking rather than typing, I can't type best. Um, the reason I brought this up, there are a lot of moving parts right now. So um, because of NISDMS policy, there's a huge interest from, you know, funders and research community um, to track data sets. So this is a great, the 12 best practices uh, supporting uh, using PIDs and using data repository uh, uh, and stuff like that. But I just want to make sure everybody uh, working on this thing are communicating together because if the one uh, doesn't know what the other hand is doing, it's not going to work. And, you know, NLM doing data set catalog is a pretty big project, but it feels like... Uh, in a data site or STM cross with uh, are not aware of it, and that could be a problem because NLM um, is you know trying to make this data set catalog is a PubMed of data set, and you know since it's uh, supported by NIH, the NIH will have a huge interest. So I want everybody to kind of communicate and collaborate together. So uh, tracking data sets coming out of data management sharing plan will be easily trackable. In terms of what we are doing at WashU, so uh, we actually are sharing this best practice in our newsletter to increase awareness. But there's, uh, we've been pushing to use your PIDs. That's a really, really important part. It's not only uh, is increased by OS, you know, OSCP Nelson Memo and then NSPM 33. So it's really important to use a PID. And then uh, data set connecting all these things together. And I want to throw in one more thing. So there's a, Data management sharing plan um, ID, another PID for a uh, DMS plan if you use DMP2. And that's another thing. And that one is making the DMS be machine actionable. So if you actually 
not only use it to write a plan, but also actually follow up after it, your grant gets funded. You can use a follow up tab to uh, update your you know, plan status. If it's a funded, you can enter the grant number and um, it's connected to a uh, read three data you know, dot org. So you can actually put DOI for your data set shared in repository and everything is machine actionable connecting through PIDs. So I just wanna bring this up to the community, um, you know, that are working on this data citation to be aware of all the things that are happening. So, you know, we can work in a more synchronous way and collaborative way and inclusive way. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, and just wanted to point out that the reason that we have these chorus forms is to is to find all those connections, right? So by talking about these things like this, um, we get to hear from stakeholders like yourself who have, you know, new things to add, and then making sure that they get uh, connected. Um, Hilke, did you want to say something in this? I think something very similar, Howard. I, mean, I fully recognize the challenge of making sure that you know everybody in this community is knowing what others are doing. There's a lot of activity, which which I would argue is a good thing. But it is sometimes challenging to know what other groups are up to and get to that level of synchronization. That was also one of the reasons for us to issue this joint statement as mm -hmm. yep. forcing function or a driver for more collaboration and, and harmonization across approaches. There are many industry bodies out there. The Research Data Alliance is, I think, uh, worth mentioning in this context that provide fora for different groups, different stakeholder groups, different entities to connect and, and, and calibrate their approaches. But, but it remains an ongoing challenge to make sure that we all understand what's happening and see where cross connections can be made. So thank you very much for also raising that to the attention here. Does any other speaker want to address that? Otherwise we'll move on to the next question. Jamie. I'll just mention specifically Sun Young called out um, in her question, the data citation corpus and incorporating the data set catalog data into the corpus. And I just, I, as a member of the Make Data Count Advisory Group, um, I want to mention that this is something scaling out the corpus is something that um, we've been talking about. There's a lot of interest in that, but right now it's really sort of in beta and and we're prototyping the corpus, and so it has a, a limited number of of data citations. All right, uh, we need to move on to more questions. So thank you. Um, I saw that there was a question uh, coming in from Mark Donahue. Mark, do you want to come off um, mute? Tara can do that for you. Go ahead, Mark. Hi, Howard. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I just had a, a question just because, um, you know, being involved with the, the registering of metadata uh, for, for some time, I was wondering if... Um, like I said, is there any support being considered among the registration agencies and or people who are you know responsible for registering or maintaining the metadata that publishers register for allowing publishers to declare sort of the schema and register the schema that they want to use to um, to uh, um, define like what relationships are being used and what they mean, and I think that would be you know really um, really helpful for, you know, allowing interoperability uh, if, you know, if you don't know what a relationship means that there is a place you can go to sort of figure it out, similar to like how schema.org is, is, you know, currently growing. You know, I think that way you're not constrained as a publisher to the relationships that are made available to you. Um, Mark, just can you just say where you're from? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm a, a program manager at IEEE. I work in the publications department. Thank you. Patricia. Yeah, so we don't have any plans to kind of open up relationship. Um, we would like to better define them, make them more consistent with what data site, for example, provides and make sure we have consistent definitions. Um, the list we have right now is is basically taken from a list of existing relationships in metadata uh, from other metadata schema and <clears throat> also from um, to answer specific needs. Um, I know sometimes it's not really clear what relationship 
to use um, um, some of the terms are, are maybe a little redundant or unclear. So we do want to help um, clarify those. We also want to more actively develop the list. I think Crossref metadata development has been moving at a little bit of a glacial pace lately, but um, <laughs> but we would like to, you know, if there's a need to expand that list, we'd like to expand it and make sure that we're consistent with what data site is doing. I don't, I can't say we have any plans to open that up and not have a vocabulary for like relationships, if that's what you're suggesting. Um, yeah, it was similar to that. Instead of just saying, here's the list that you can use and you have to conform to that list, you can say, you can set the rules for making your own list. And then the rules dictate how you discover what those items actually mean. And, uh, you know, I think that is a way to sort of get you out of having to manage the list and then also sort of create the rules to productively converge on sort of eventually a useful like a uh, set of like relationships. Uh, you'll never converge on it if you have to, you know, you, you define it at the outset. Um, and that's just, just my, my point of view. So I, I would, I would explain it better if, if it didn't just occur to me during this, this talk, but okay. you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, instead of saying like, you know, I would say like the success of the web in general is more due to the openness of it, uh, than it is to saying, here's, you know, how it's going to work from the outset. Great. Thank you, Mark. So, uh, we've probably got about time for one more question. I did see one more question maybe one or two, um, but there was a question in the Q&A that was answered, but I think it's worth bringing up here. And the question was from somebody anonymous, sorry, so we can't bring, bring you out um, to ask uh, verbally, but it says, in addition to data sharing, how much has data review been integrated into the peer review process and will that increase and how might that affect the peer review process? Katie, do you want, I see you had an answer there, but maybe you want to verbalize that a bit more? Yeah, just to pop some quick thoughts in. So yeah, peer reviewers certainly will routinely assess the data that's contained within an article, sometimes in the supplementary data, sometimes linked from the article deposited in a, in a repository in the process of reviewing the work. Um, it's certainly something we're sort of look, exploring and looking at formalizing. We have a range of data sharing policies across our journals and the most um, enhanced of those is policy option E. And we do have that in place on some journals. So data and brief is one example where it's a formal part of the process that the, um, the peer reviewer must have formally fully assessed and report back to the editor on the data associated with that work as well. Um, but we need to be mindful that some fields um, have field-specific differences. So social sciences, for example, we see that double, an double anonymized peer review is very common. Um, and in those fields, there'll be additional considerations. So sharing the research data will potentially breach that author anonymity. So we need to sort of bear those field-specific differences in mind as we think about rolling that kind of policy out further. But yeah, great question. Anyone else? Uh, Hilko. Yeah, just to add, I think this is the picture that we're also seeing across publishers in, in the general space of scholarly publishing, that there are emerging practices, but it's not yet very standardized or very well defined what, what flavors of data review exists. I, I would like to take the opportunity to do a little shout out to some recent work that we've been involved with on defining the standard terminology for peer review per se in and of itself. That doesn't speak specifically about the data aspect. So I do think this would be fruitful ground for, for, for future work to try and work towards common understanding of what, what does it mean to review data, what levels of data review exist, and, and ensure that we have some interoperability and transparency around those practices. And perhaps worth adding that some journals do have statistical reviewers as well, which perform that sort of particular role on, yeah. on research yeah, data sets. Point. So that's quite widespread in some fields. Good point. So I'm going to Take moderator privilege. Uh, Daniel, you had one last question, I think. Do you want to ask that question and then we get a quick answer from, from, from everyone here? Sure. Uh, so I don't know if anybody caught it, but I but I had an idea at the end of my, my presentation talking about uh, basically making uh, PIDs mandatory in data citations where ap applicable. So I want to just give a shout out to attorney publishers and, and hear what they have to, to say about that idea. 
think this is back to me again then. Um, <laughs> I think it speaks to sort of the point I was making towards the latter part of the, the presentation I gave, which is it really is about that kind of cross stakeholder collaboration. So publishers could, you know, mandate data sharing, but actually if there's not the right investment put in place by, you know, the funders, if there's not the right education in place at institutions, then it really puts researchers in a difficult position. So I think it's about that kind of collective action, everyone moving forward together. And I know that's, yeah, that feels like a bit of a cop out, but it truly is, you know, is something that's essential, that collaboration. And I think that's why these best practices are so valuable because they really emphasize the need for that. And with that, we are drawing to a close. I wanna thank all of our speakers and everyone that's raised questions today. I think it was a good dialogue. And of course, this is not the only place to do the dialogue. Please keep it going. Um, and you will see that we have a list on our website of where you can ask more questions. And a big thank you to our sponsors, AIP Publishing, AAP, Crossref, Geoscience World, and STM. And we will be having more of these events coming out in 2024. So feel free to visit our website. Next one, I believe is in May. So um, again, big thank you to everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, wherever that might be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Howard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.